This video is about peripartum cardiomyopathy. The reference is talk article which was published in 2021. Peripartum cardiomyopathy is defined as idiopathic cardiomyopathy with heart failure due to left ventricular systolic dysfunction in the end of the pregnancy or up to six months postpartum. It is a diagnosis of exclusion. Ejection fraction is almost always less than 45%, which is an important part of the definition of peripartum cardiomyopathy. The incidence of peripartum cardiomyopathy is 1 in 1,000 to 4,000 pregnancies. It is highest in Nigeria, which is around 1 in 100 life births, and in Haiti, one in 300 life births. It is most common in afro caribbean lineage, which has poor prognosis. The risk factors for peripartum cardiomyopathy are multipedity, multiple pregnancy, obesity, chronic hypertension, advanced maternal age more than 30 years. 22% patients with peripartum cardiomyopathy have preeclampsia, which is four times more than the general population. Regarding the pathogenesis of peripartum cardiomyopathy, different theories are proposed like viral induced myocarditis, but none of them have been proved so far. Peripartum cardiomyopathy is due to multifactorial reasons. There may be some genetic factors involved. Mutations of different genes which regulate the myocyte function can lead to peripartum cardiomyopathy. There may be vascular hormonal models responsible for peripartum cardiomyopathy. In normal pregnancy, transcriptase factor STAT3 becomes, becomes activated which leads to increased prolactin levels. In peripartum cardiomyopathy, there is reduced STAT3 expression, which leads to increase in reactive oxidative species, which leads to increased cathepsin D, which cleaves prolactin into 16K DA fragment, resulting in greater cardiac endothelial and capillary dysfunction. Bromocryptin can be used, which helps in reversing the systolic impairment. Placenta releases SFLT1, which drastically decreases after childbirth in healthy women, but it persists in peripartum cardiomyopathy. Another aspect of pathogenesis of peripartum cardiomyopathy is a two-hit theory, which is proposed. There is secretion of prolactin by the anterior pituitary, enhanced production of endothelial microRNAs 146A, and placental secretion of soluble FMs like tyrosine kinase receptor on a background of genetic susceptibility which ultimately leads to endothelial dysfunction and cardiomyocyte apoptosis. Regarding the clinical presentation of peripartum cardiomyopathy, it may present in a variable pattern from mild symptoms to end-stage heart failure and even death. It is common for symptoms to abate and spontaneous recovery occurs. It is important to know the timing of the symptoms. 78% of the patients with peripartum cardiomyopathy, they present with symptoms within four months postpartum. 9% of the patients, they present in the last month of pregnancy. 13% present either one month before delivery or within four months postpartum. The symptoms of peripartum cardiomyopathy are dyspnea, orthopnea, unexplained cough, palpitations, dizziness, legs swelling. There may be signs of heart failure, 
third heart sound may be present and there may be displaced apex beat this is a table which will help you for the diagnostic approach of peripartum cardiomyopathy you have to look for the symptoms of heart failure then the initial evaluation is based on the history physical examination and the investigations which we are going to discuss in a short while according to embrace 2019 there are a few red red flag signs of peripartum cardiomyopathy like tachypnea chest pain persistent tachycardia or orthopnea they must always be fully investigated investigated one must make a diagnosis rather than simply excluding a diagnosis patients may have a diagnostic delay as there is overlap with the physiological symptoms of pregnancy peripartum cardiomyopathy is associated with risks in early postpartum period there is 3 to 4 times increased risk of myocardial infarction 5 to time 5 to 10 times increased risk of having pulmonary embolism intracardiac thrombus may occur especially if left ventricle ejection fraction is less than 35% 20% of patients may develop ventricular arrhythmias regarding the differential diagnosis this is the table which is from the article and it is one of a very important table if you go through this table it's going to be helpful for you to distinguish different diagnoses like benign dyspnea of pregnancy arrhythmias amniotic fluid embolism asthma pre existing heart disease hiv cardiomyopathy pre existing valvular heart disease which is unmasked by the pregnancy hypertensive heart disease cardiac dysfunction secondary to ischemia and pulmonary embolism it's a very important table you must go through it in detail regarding the investigations of peripartum cardiomyopathy it is often a diagnosis of exclusion one must keep high index of suspicion and it's very important to do a timely workup ecg it has no specific findings related to peripartum cardiomyopathy the common features are sinus tachycardia with non specific st segment and t wave abnormalities in the lab tests c reactive protein and white blood counts may be raised although they are non specific finding hemoglobin may be decreased troponin t levels are within the normal range bnp and nt pro bnp they are the established markers for heart failure both may be increased in the peripartum cardiomyopathy but they are not specific for this condition chest x ray may show typical features of cardiac strain like alveolar shadowing septal lines cardiomegaly pulmonary embolism or pleural effusion however they are not specific for peripartum cardiomyopathy echocardiography is the most helpful among all the investigations left ventricle ejection fraction less than 4% is an essential criterion for peripartum cardiomyopathy diagnosis and it is also to predict the diag- the prognosis of this condition if there is coexistent right ventricular dysfunction it is associated with poorer outcomes the best predictor for recovery is left ventricular size and ejection fraction left ventricle end diastolic diameter more than 6 cm and left ventricle ejection fraction less than 30% is associated with decreased chance of recovery and increased likelihood of mechanical support and death continuing with the, with the 
investigations, cardiac MRI is a useful tool for imaging. It accurately assesses the cardiac chamber volume and systolic function. It is more sensitive than echocardiography to identify intracardiac thrombos. However, it is not to be used as an initial investigation. Gadolinium contrast is contraindicated during the pregnancy, but in a woman postpartum who is breastfeeding, gadolinium can be used. Endomyocardial biopsy is rarely performed. It may be indicated if there is diagnostic uncertainty. This is a very useful flow chart for evaluating suspected acute peripartum cardiomyopathy. If a patient presents with shortness of breath towards the end of pregnancy or in the postpartum period, check BNP and NT pro BNP and echocardiography. If BNP and NT pro BNP are raised and ejection fraction is less than 45%, Cardiologists must be involved and you must consider peripartum cardiomyopathy and other cardiovascular differential diagnosis. However, if BNP and NT pro BNP are normal and ejection fraction is more than 45%, peripartum cardiomyopathy is unlikely and you must consider non cardiovascular causes of the symptoms. The management of peripartum cardiomyopathy should be based on a few general principles. The patient should have a planned care, which is managed in a multidisciplinary team. Patient-centered approach should be taken. There must be optical, optimal medical therapy, plus minus mechanical augmentation of both circulation and ventilation. Regarding the pharmacotherapy, it is the same as for generalized heart failure. It should be given at least until the ejection fraction recovers. If anticoagulation started, it must be continued for six to eight months postpartum. An important point to note. Now, there may be a few different scenarios in which a patient with peripartum cardiomyopathy present, and now let's see how we will be managing those patients. If a patient is pregnant and she is hemodynamically stable, the first line of management would be to have salt restriction. You may start with the loop diuretics. Beta blockers should be started, preferably selective beta-1 antagonists. ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists are contraindicated in pregnancy. To reduce the afterload, hydralazine with nitrates may be used. Low molecular weight heparin is indicated, while warfarin should be avoided during pregnancy. Please note there is high risk of VTE in patients with peripartum cardiomyopathy, and the risk is around 2 to 6%. There may be another scenario in which the patient is postpartum, she's breastfeeding, and hemodynamically stable. In this case, we will continue with the beta blockers. We can give ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and MRAs, Hydrolyzine and nitrates can also be used, but in these patients, ACE inhibitors and ARBs are preferable. We can use low molecular weight heparin as well as warfarin in these patients. If a patient is postpartum and not breastfeeding, all the options can be used without any restriction. This is a very important table which will tell you about the safety profile of drugs which are used in heart failure. And you must understand these, these drugs so that you can choose the safe drugs during the pregnancy and lactations. Please go through this table in detail. Another scenario could be that the patient is hemodynamically unstable. 
In this case, we need to have rapid and aggressive therapy, patient to be admitted to the ICU. To optimize the preload, IV diuretics are used, especially if systolic blood pressure is more than uh, 110 millimeters of mercury. I mean to say, if systolic blood pressure is more than 110, IV diuretics can be safely started. Adequate oxygen should be maintained. Maintain SpO2 more than 95%. Keep the patient upright. Continuous positive airway pressure, CPAP. It may decrease the intubation rates. In refractory hypoxia, intubation and ventilation should be considered. You may need to provide circulatory support with inotopic vasopressors in those patients who have cardiogenic shock. Must act quickly to avoid the organ damage. Urgent delivery is indicated if heart failure occurs during pregnancy. The patient should be transferred and treated in the tertiary unit. Please remember, maternal safety is always the priority. You may need to deliver regardless of the gestational age. Support with bromocryptin is also indicated in a few patients. And you can start with 2.5 milligrams of bromocryptin daily, which should be at least given for one week. You may use it for extended time if ejection fraction is less than 25% along with cardiogenic shock. A point to notice is that if bromocryptin is started, low molecular weight heparin must also be given. There may be indication of mechanical circulatory support especially if inotropic support fails. There are a few short-term initial therapies, which include temporarily ventricular support devices, IABP, intra-aortic balloon pumps. They augment the circulation by reducing the afterload and improving coronary flow. Intraventricular pumps, they help in maintaining the cardiac output. However, none of the above have any effect on oxygenation. Extracorporeal membrane oxygenation may be needed. Prolonged support is provided with the help of long-term ventricular assist devices, which could be biventricular assist devices or left ventricular assist devices. Please remember that bridge to definitive management it is actually a bridge to optimal recovery in the patients. 5% of patients with peripartum cardiomyopathy, they need mechanical support or transplant. It is associated with higher mortality and poor outcomes. This is an important flow chart which will help you with the management of acute heart failure in pregnancy, please go through this chart. This box is a checklist for the management of acute heart failure, which is caused by peripartum cardiomyopathy. And we have discussed almost all the points. This is the summary of these points. There are a few pregnancy-specific considerations when we are managing peripartum cardiomyopathy. Most of the patients, they present postnatally. However, if they present in the antenatal period, they usually present in the later part of pregnancy. You must consider the effect of drugs on the fetus. Fetal growth restriction monitoring is to be done with growth scans. The patient should be managed in the high-risk obstetrics unit. The time of the delivery is to be balanced with maternal status and fetal maturity. At any point, the mother becomes unstable. This is an indication for urgent delivery. Mode of delivery is preferably vaginal if 
no overt cardiac failure symptoms are there. Caesarean section and induction of labor is done only for obstetrical reasons. Corticosteroids can be given from 24 to 35 plus 6 weeks. There must be a detailed intrapartum plan which should be documented. Continuous electronic fetal monitoring is indicated in these patients. Regarding the other monitorings during the labor, hourly fluid balance, blood pressure, pulse, respiratory rate, and oxygen levels to be checked. If the patient is admitted in ICU, she should have continuous ECG and pulse oximetry. Patient should have 30 degrees left tilt. Low dose re regional analgesia is okay to give. One must shorten the second stage of labor with assisted vaginal birth. In third stage of labor, slow oxytocin infusion can be given and if needed, Corboprost and prostaglandin F2 alpha can also be used. However, ergometrine and long acting oxytocin analogs are contraindicated in these patients. Regarding the breastfeeding, there are no clear consensus. Breastfeeding can be done if the patient is hemodynamically stable. You must not use long acting carvedilol or spinorolactones, they are contraindicated in breastfeeding. Ensure the patient has optimal treatment of cardiomyopathy and heart failure. Breastfeeding is contraindicated in those women who are hemodynamically unstable, symptomatic, and those with left ventricle ejection fraction less than 45%. The prognosis of peripartium cardiomyopathy, 50 to 80% of the patients, they achieve recovery if left ventricle ejection fraction is more than 50%. And that occurs mostly within the six months of developing the condition. Overall mortality with peripartum cardiomyopathy is 10%. A point to note is that Peripartum cardiomyopathy associated with hypertension has better recovery rates. One must use safe and dependable contraception. Barrier methods alone are not to be used. If required, IUCD should be fitted in the hospital setting in these patients. Prophylactic antibiotics are not recommended at the time of IUCD insertion. Long-acting reversible contraception with progesterone is a safer option. Sterilization can be discussed, both male and female sterilization. While discussing about the female sterilization, patient must be informed about the risks of anesthesia. In the subsequent pregnancy, If there is persistent left ventricle dysfunction, there is 50% chance of further worsening. There is 20% mortality in the subsequent pregnancy. Complete recovery has better prognosis. Still, 20% of the patients may relapse in the next pregnancy. Patients should be counseled not to become pregnant if left ventricle ejection fraction was less than 20% at the time of diagnosis and it has not normalized. Before contemplating the next pregnancy, patients should have proper preconception counseling, discussing all the effects she may have in her subsequent pregnancy. If the patient becomes pregnant, the management in subsequent pregnancy should be done in the tertiary care centers in a multidisciplinary team. Medications to be reviewed, patient should have early booking and she should be given consultant-led care all throughout her antenatal period. She should have frequent visits. Continue the treatment with beta blockers and monitor with echocardiography and BNP. There is a sh screening schedule for echocardiography, which I'll be sharing with you in the next slide. 
low molecular weight heparin should be started serial scans for from 24 weeks to be done for fetal growth restriction time of delivery depends on the obstetrical indications however it should be around 37 weeks of gestation vaginal delivery is recommended cesarean section is indicated only for obstetrical reasons and patient must continue with anticoagulation 6 weeks postpartum this is the schedule of screening echocardiography patient must have an echocardiography in the preconception period and echocardiography at the end of first trimester at the end of second trimester one month before delivery after delivery and one month after delivery and as needed for worrying clinical signs and symptoms so please remember this that's all thank you for your time